get that emotion out, write in your journal how you feel. I want to wring their neck. They know they were wrong. And then go in your prayer closet and pray for those who despitefully use you. That's what a mature saint will do. It's not denying your emotion and repressing your emotion and acting like this didn't happen because eventually your body will, your, will turn on you. You confuse yourself. If you don't know your own thoughts and feelings and where you are separate from other people, how do you have integrity? Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. As you're being seated, as Pastor Frank said, and I just blessed my heart. I needed a little shot in the arm. I'm feeling a little, I was feeling a little tired after the flesh, but that gave me a little shot in the arm. So I appreciate my, my wonderful brother in Christ, Pastor of, of Word of Faith Toledo, as well, Pastor Frank and Minister Morgan Davis, and they are a great blessing. And we're also two of my best students as well. <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, also want to give honor to the entire ministerial staff. Um, that we labor together here holding up the arms of the bishop and ministering to you all as we're called upon to do so in various ways and at various times. And of course, I want to give honor to Bishop Butler and Pastor Deborah who are taking a little bit of a, a well-needed break this week as well. And to Pastor, Pastor Michelle and Pastor Lee Ferguson, also our executive pastors, I greatly appreciate them and some of what I'm going to talk about, uh, the effect that they've had on my life, um, what the Lord is having me to minister tonight. So let's go ahead. And the Lord just shifted my entire, you know, my entire, the way I have everything laid out while I was standing there during, during praise. Let's say praise and worship during praise. Uh, <laughs> during praise and worship there. So we're going to start in an entirely different place that I did not intend to go to tonight. But I want to see how the Lord is going to do it. I know it's going to be good because it's straight from the throne. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. That might be a problem. When you get there, say amen. amen. All right. So I'm just going to be real with you all tonight because I, I believe that and I see this, is, this, this necklace is going to be a problem, huh, Billy? Yeah, I'm just going to take it off. Y'all seen it, it's cute. Pastor, Pastor Michelle gave it to me, it's fun, ladies, right? It's gone, not, not as important as somebody else being able to hear the message later on. And so Matthew chapter five, I'm um, gonna be real with you tonight because sometimes uh, just human nature is that we wanna put our best foot forward, right? So you meet somebody new, you wanna put your best foot forward, right? You're standing up on a platform like this, even sometimes without thinking about it, you wanna put your best foot forward. I'm going to throw that away tonight. I'm going to just start off <laughs> with what the Lord said to me recently. There is a very challenging issue that I've been dealing with, and I've been trying to figure out, uh, you know, how I was going to handle this particular issue. In fact, what I recognized was that I got to the place where, and I, I am, uh, um, I've gone to law school. Uh, I'm an attorney as well as a minister of the gospel. I graduated from Raymond Bible Training Center 24 years ago this year, which is insane to me. <clears throat> so I consider myself and my personality type and because of what I've been called to do as somebody who is very confidential, right? Um, as somebody who is, who's able to keep things close to the vest. But I noticed that this particular issue had been nagging on me so hard and pulling on me repeatedly that I found myself in a couple of situations where it was like, you know, a water hose. You know, if you just turn a water hose on, you, you finally kind of just started and just, and the water just kind of comes out just a little bit. But if you put, if you turn that thing all the way up, it's gonna come out with some force. Even more so, if you block it, if you squeeze that thing tight and hold it down, and then just all of a sudden, you know, you let that thing go. It's coming out with some force. So I noticed that I was responding that way when a particular challenge was rubbing up against me. And, you know, it's one of those things that um, I believe I'm right, right? Most of the time we believe we're right in an issue. I believe that I'm right in the way that I'm seeing a particular issue, but that's really not what matters. 
And so I finally just, you know, I really felt like, okay, I know here's one thing I can do. I can go and seek some counsel. So I went and sat down with somebody who I, who I also respect and look up to, who is also confidential, just to kind of have a conversation. And it was really helpful me to, for me to start pulling apart because it was such a layered thing. You know, when you're dealing with, you know, working with other people and arm in arm with folks and submitting to folks and having people that report to you, it, things can get kind of tied up, you know, and, and sometimes, especially if you have ever struggled with really dealing with your real emotions, not have any rep repressors in the room, you, you don't like, somebody like, how do you feel? You're like, I don't know. I, I don't know. You're like, you know something is bothering you or you know something's not quite right, but it takes you some time to kind of find that thing. Um, and so here I was, and I did that, had this conversation, and it was really helpful for me to kind of figure out, okay, now I know what next step to take. But I still wasn't handling it the right way. And the Lord really highlighted it for me uh, a week or so maybe ago. It might have been two weeks now. But I was like dozing off to sleep, and this scripture just <laughs> rose up in my heart. So we're going to look at Matthew 5 here, verse 44. I'm gonna, let's go to verse 43. Let me jump one, one up, sorry. You have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now let me pause here for a minute. We're all different. We all have different personalities, different life experiences. So there may be an element of this verse that, that jumps out at you like a little bit more than another. For me, it's that despitefully use you. Ugh. I, I got the, I know we're, we're in this world and the world hated Jesus so much so that after raising Lazarus from the dead and people running and coming to see what he did and people are, you know, Hosanna coming in, that the same people turned on him and said, crucify him. The Bible tells us that people will hate us because they hated Jesus. I know people will hate me. I've been hearing it my whole life. I'm ready for those moments when they come and somebody is hating on me and there's really no, no most of the time, there's really no real reason for it. You just hate because you're hateful. I, I can do that, Lord. I, I, can, I can bless that person. I can, okay, the person that curses you, same boat to me. Y'all in the same boat. That despitefully used... That one right there is the one. I mean, to the point of where I, I used to have problems with, or you, I used to not like it. And I've told my husband this when he's ministering sometimes. I don't like when people say, God is going to use you. I don't like the connotation that I hear when I hear the word use. And that's based on my own personal experience and my own life experience. And I'm sure there's something that maybe you don't like about this verse. It may be all of it. Because that don't make no sense. My mama told me not to be no doormat. You know, that might, whatever that is. But that despitefully used, man. Now when I'm like, this is intentional and you are using someone and not actually treating them the way that they should be treated. And you know that you're not treating them the way they should be treated. So that's the one. I said, okay, Lord, I, I hear you. I keep reading. Verse 45. That ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. Mm. In other words, when I do these things, when I love my enemies, when I bless the people that curse me, when I do good to those people that hate me, when I pray for people which despitefully use me and persecute me, or when you do it, those are indications that we are actually children of the Father God. Listen to why it says this. It says, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain to the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Don't, do not even the publicans or the sinners, people that don't even know God, don't they do the same? Love people who love them and hate people that hate them. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans or the sinners or those who don't know God, don't they do that? Don't they, aren't they greeting only the people that are their brethren? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Thank God that word perfect there doesn't mean perfect. 
The Amplified verse is a little, a little bit more clear for our understanding. It says, you therefore must be perfect, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity as your heavenly father is perfect. So God expects us to have some level of maturity that we don't just respond in the flesh when somebody is treating us wrong. Let me separate this out for a second. It doesn't mean you don't have emotion. Because I think sometimes that's where we muddy the water. God has emotions. The Bible says that God has been angry. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion. God has emotions. And Genesis 1 tells us, he said, let us make man in our, own, in our image and after our likeness. So we're made after the class of God. I'm not saying deny your emotion. You might need to take a moment before you respond. You might need to have a conversation with a close confidant who you know also is going to encourage you to do the right thing. You may need to untangle that thing. That's what I really needed to do in that case. I needed to untangle. Things were so tangled, I didn't even know what I felt and what all I felt and why I felt the way I felt. So sitting down with somebody who was more mature than me in the faith, who was confidential for me, was helpful to just identify where I really am and why, what my emotions are flagging for me. Because sometimes your emotions are telling you something is wrong. Anybody? It's not always that, you know, you are in the wrong. Sometimes your emotions are telling you somebody is crossing a boundary that they should not be crossing with you. So I'm not saying that this is the response we have, that somebody comes in and they, you know, cuss you out and they go off on you and, and you just, no, I'm just going to, here, have five bucks. And that's the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> you might need a minute. You might need to go and become less angry and send them that $5 in the mail. You might need to go into your, get that emotion out, write in your journal how you feel. I want to wring their neck. They know they were wrong. And then go in your prayer closet and pray for those who despitefully use you. That's what a mature saint will do. It's not denying your emotion and repressing your emotion and acting like this didn't happen because eventually your body will, your, will turn on you. You confuse yourself. If you don't know your own thoughts and feelings and where you are separate from other people, how do you have integrity? How do you trust yourself? So he says here that this is an indicator when we behave this way, when we live this way, when we bless those people that are trifling, when we do good to those people that are hating on you, not when you blow up social media responding to somebody hating on your post. <laughs> I hear some scattered giggles because a good chunk of y'all aren't on social media and then the rest of y'all are. Um, you know, and this is, this is hard. You know, I feel bad sometimes if I'm on social media and I see like people just pile driving on celebrities. And I'm like, man, y'all, like, woo, just thousands of people just, you know, you stink, just... <laughs> I'm like, man, these are people, and bless them. Some of them are smart enough not to read their own stuff, but for those who can't control themselves and do, these are real people with real feelings. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ ought not be up here talking about evangelists and pastor so-and-so on social media. The Bible says that the world will know us by our love. It's not that people don't need to be checked, but you're not the one to check them. Are they submitted to you? Are you their pastor or their bishop? If not, close your mouth until you can get in your prayer closet and pray. I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything that I don't live. It is not easy. I've said it before getting up here. It's not easy it's just seeing how people do sometimes the staff here or do bishop, or, or Pastor Michelle, or some of, some of the comments, you know, you're a woman, you need to keep your mouth closed. And I'd be sitting there like, don't talk to my sister like that. You know, it's not, that stuff is not easy, but you have to make a decision. I'm either going to act like what God said is true, which is really what faith is. Faith is just saying, 
Whatever God has said is absolutely true, and I'm going to act like everything he said is absolutely true. So if he told me to behave this way towards people who hate on me, towards people who despitefully use me, so forth and so on, then if that indicates that I am a follower of him, I'm going to believe him. Because I know what God's followers get. His word says that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, we're called as when you're born again and you come to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're picking up the mantle of discipleship. And that word disciple, when you actually break it down into the Greek, that word disciple there means student. So you're committing to a lifelong journey of being a student of the word of God, being a student of God's way of doing things, being a student of how the kingdom of God operates. And sometimes we get away from that. We let life's trials, we let the difficult things that happen, we let being despitefully used, we let hurt get in the way and we find ourselves offended. It could be at God, it could be at somebody on the staff, it could be at whoever else. And before we know it, if we don't respond in a godly way, the way he says, we can find ourselves stumbling and tripping and falling and getting further away from God. Everything that God has told us in his word is for our good. Any piece of direction that he's given us is for you to be able to live at the highest level. Jesus said in John, he said, I came so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. An abundant life is not a broke down life. An abundant life is not an emotionally distraught life. An abundant life is not a life that's in financial ruins. Now, maybe you're early in your journey or maybe you're coming back to God and you have some things that need to be fixed up. But if you keep going on that path of discipleship and being a student of his word, you will find yourself in a place where you look and you go, whoa, this is way different than it was over there. I'm living the abundant life that God has for me. Let's go to Mark chapter 12. Praise the name of the Lord. Mark chapter 12, we're going to read here verses 30 and 31. Verse 30 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Notice he said there's no other commandment. We know there's 10 commandments, right, that God gave to Moses to give to the children, of, uh, the children of Israel. But he said there's no commandment that's greater than these two. In fact, in another place, it tells us that if we fulfill these two commandments, we will fulfill all of the law. All of the commandments are, will be fulfilled by just fulfilling these commandments. And what the Lord specifically wanted me to talk to you about this evening and the message that he wanted me to bring to you was about connection. I was very uncomfortable with this, by the way. I was like, Lord? <laughs> okay, I know your voice. So the title of the message tonight, you'll see where we're headed with it, is Created for Connection. Created for Connection. So we see here that we're, we're commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, and with all of our strength. But we're also commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves and told that these are the greatest commandments. You know, back in February, uh, a particular cell phone carrier, their, their network, they had a net, experienced a network outage. Anybody have an SOS on their phone in February for several hours? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Wave at me if you know what I'm talking about. All right, so I was one of those folks, and I was extremely perplexed for multiple reasons. One, I was out of town, so my kids were riding in a different vehicle, you know, and I'm like, what? I hadn't even looked at my phone. You know, I woke up, we got, did what we were supposed to do and got ready and we were headed off somewhere. I hadn't even looked at my phone. I finally look at my phone. I'm like, oh, SOS, what's going on? Let me turn it off. Let me turn it on. 
so forth and so on, and just end up hearing from somebody else that, you know, there was a, a, some type of an outage. So then I'm looking at my husband. Oh, let me see your phone. Same carrier, same plan. His phone works. I'm like, what? <laughs> what in the world is going on, you know? And so then I'm like, okay, well, at least if there's an issue or an emergency, somebody will, you know, they can reach you. So hopefully folks will reach you. But what was, you know, irritating about that besides, you know, once we were going to a restaurant initially, so when I get to the restaurant, one of the first things I'm going to hear is, Mommy, can I have a phone? Mommy, can I have, like, please, you have this till the food comes so the adults can talk, you know? <laughs> so I'm thinking, like, okay, go ahead. You can play your little game or whatever, but I can't, my phone is of no use. Well, one of the things that's really annoying about a phone not working, your phone not connecting or not getting a signal is because you're literally, especially talking about a phone like a, an, an iPhone or an Android phone that has internet, it's literally the purpose of its creation was for you to be able to connect. Right? I mean, I go back far enough to where I had a pager. <laughs> In high school, we just had to go, you know, if I got a page, it was only like three people that had the number, my mama, my daddy, and my best friend, right? But if I got a page, I could go and go and, and make a phone call or go to the front office at school and say, hey, my, my parents are trying to reach me. I don't know what's going on. And they would let me make a call or I could use a pay phone. There was, it was a phone that was created to connect. So the irritating thing was, I mean, it was mine and it was, might as well have been a brick, for however long, I think it went out around three, mine didn't come back till four o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock, something like that. But the thing that was annoying about it was the, it was useless pretty much that entire time. I was like, okay, I'm paying this bill, so how much are they gonna take off this bill for how many hours has this been down? Okay, thank you. It was annoying, because it was created to connect, and now, although I could probably still use the calculator, Although in an, in, a, in an emergency, if there was a situation and I needed to reach out to 911, there may have been a way I was able to reach them, you know, through Apple Internet or something of that nature. But the reason that I specifically have the phone for, can't use it. And so let's flip over to Genesis chapter 1. Many of us have become unplugged, so to speak. We've lost our connection specifically with one another. For some people, it's because of the pandemic. You know, you, you got used to a new normal, and so you kind of, your, your world was rebuilt, folks was quitting their jobs, some people were never coming back, leaving whole, you know, been in, went to school for seven, eight years, and walk, completely walking away from their profession and not returning to it, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of changes. Some of us have become unplugged because of that. Some of us have become unplugged because we were hurt. Because somebody did something to us that they should not have done or said something to us they should not have said, and we made a decision that this is, this is it. I'm done. I got me and my kids. We're good. I don't, I don't, I don't, I want to, let me just live in my own little bubble in isolation on purpose because I do not want to put myself out here like this again. And you all are the folks that the Lord sent me to primarily here tonight, although there's all kind of stuff that he was dropping that I know is for people in different places. Because the word of God tells us, when we talk about the kingdom of God and God's way of, of doing things, and we look at, we talk about the family here, right? In Genesis chapter 1, and we go to the story of creation, and we see God created man, and he created woman. And so this is how we know that he, he designed a family to be a man and a woman. There are things that we know looking at the scripture. Well, let's look here at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It said, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So verse 27 tells us God did. He created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God is a relational God. He created a man and a woman to be able to fellowship and have relationship with him. That was part of the intent in creating us. He created, he put the man to sleep and created a woman out of the man 
so that the man wouldn't have to be by himself. In fact, he said, it is not good that the man be alone. I will make a help meet for him. There's so many scriptures that talk about us as Christians and how we're brethren and how we're to provoke one another to good works and how we're supposed to care for each other and carry each other's burdens, how we're supposed to confess our faults one to another so that we may be healed. But you cannot do it without true, genuine, vulnerable community. And community doesn't mean you come in here and you sit during the service. You get here right when services starts, and then you go out the door and you leave, and you've been a part of the church community. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm also not talking about the other. You know, everybody knows that exuberant person that just seems like they're friends with everybody. I'm not talking about that either. That, that might work for that personality, but that's, that's not for everybody. You will end up frustrated and confused about who you, who, what, what, who's where what, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about true, genuine relationship. Who can you call when you don't have anything left in you to fight? Who can you call that will encourage you? Who can you call? I, you know, like, the, I, I don't want to try to do, I want to, no, okay. So there's a person in this room, I'll say, there's a couple people that are in this room. I haven't really looked at everybody, but that I know that I could genuinely call and say, I am jacked up right now. I am overwhelmed, and I, I am struggling, and I need some assistance. And they will show up. One of them, she knows who she is when I say this, would show up with like a quiche. What can I do? How can I, what do you need? You need, you need, me to, you need a babysitter? You need to go out and have some time to yourself, or you need to go out with your husband? Another one would just pat me on the back. It's going to be all right. Offer me a hug. Have a conversation. Y'all want to come over? You want to come and sit down and talk? Who do you have that you can be open and vulnerable with about where you are? Because God designed it so that we could lock in arm step with one another. And listen, this is something that, uh, this is a recent, more of a recent revelation in my life. This is not how I chose to be growing up. I didn't want that many friends. I didn't. I didn't. I was one of those people that I got in trouble. I used to go to one relative's house, and they wanted me to come play with the female, female relative, and I would be like, can I play Nintendo with the boy relative? Because that's what I would rather be doing, and it would be like a frustrating thing, because that's, you know, I get it now. I got a, a girl that doesn't have, you know, sisters or that has, a, you know, you've got a big age gap. I get it, but at the time, you know, that just kind of wasn't my thing. I, I didn't want to do that. I don't want to play dress up. This, I want to, you know, okay, we can do this. We can play with some Barbies for a minute, but then I want to go play Nintendo. Or I want to go, I played on the football team in elementary school at FCA. Like, I wanted to play sports. I, wanted to, I wasn't necessarily a tomboy, but I just, I had an older brother who I thought was really cool. So I was open to anything he was open to. Right? Still do have an older brother. <laughs> it was really cool. But as a kid, and so, you know, Basically, you know, I made a decision early on after a couple of different incidents with people just being, you know, kids that like, yeah, I don't really want to hang out with girls. I'm good. Too much. It's too much. It's just it's too much to deal with. I was one of those people. So it wasn't that I wouldn't have a female friend. It was just very limited. I don't want I don't like talking on the phone. Can't stand it. At my house, the talker, his name is Pastor Joel. That is the talker. If I don't know you. I'll be Pastor Deborah over here. I'll be sitting here. <laughs> it just wasn't my thing. Just not how I was built. And when I did finally connect with somebody who could understand how my life was growing up as a, a preacher's kid in a fishbowl with this church and all these different people. I was born into this church and could, everybody seemed to have expectations. When I could find somebody I like, got close to, their parents got promoted to go start a church, a satellite church, out of town. So I'd be like, oh, forget it. <laughs> you know, so this was not something for me that, that came naturally. It really wasn't. And the Lord had to start peeling back and kind of showing me, you know, at times we let trauma come in from things that have happened, and it could be something that, it, it could be big. But sometimes it's small, and it's your rehearsal of a thing 
over and over without processing how it actually, how you feel about it, that can cause you to put up a wall where you should have put a gate, where you should have put a fence. The great blessing to me, we read in uh, The God's Beauties, we read this book, Boundaries. Um, and if you have never read the book Boundaries by, ooh, I'm jacking up their name. Dr. John Townsend is the second author. The first one will come back to me. But um, if you haven't read that book, I would, it's got something, to me, it's got something for everybody in it. You will find yourself somewhere in the book or your mama and figure out how to deal with your mama or whatever, whatever that is. It's a wonderful book. And so the Lord started revealing some things to me. You got walls up, honey, where there should, this should just be a fence. But you got like cement walls layered together if you are not in a certain place you got these walls up and you're not letting the good in you're keeping in the good you're keeping out the good and keeping in the bad which is why I believe he wanted me to minister this tonight and so we have to make a decision really that we're going to do what the bible says and opening yourself up for relationships and for connection with other people means sometimes you really got to get into 1 Corinthians 13. And really, how does love respond? Because you will never find a person to be in your life who is perfect other than God himself. Everybody is going to make a mistake. And it's not for you to judge whether they should have known better or not because you did not grow up in their shoes. You don't know what their intentions are at all turns. You don't understand exactly how their mind works. God is a relational God, and he built us for relationships. He built us for connection. Part of that is connecting with one another. Obviously, we want to connect with God first and foremost. Last year, the Lord took me on a journey through John 15. I mean, he just kept, we just kept going back and back and back. And John 15 talks about the fact that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And that we have to stay in unity with him, in connection with him, because if we don't abide in him and allow his words to abide in us, then number one, for those who are reward motivated first and foremost, you can't ask what you will and have it done unto you. But what's even scarier to me, quote unquote there, is it says that apart from me, you can do nothing. So you can have every gifting and talent you want to have. You can flow in gifts of the spirit and do all kinds of things. But if you are not connected to the vine and you don't have an ongoing personal relationship with Jesus where you can talk to him and you give him time to talk back to you, where you go and read his word and ask him to help you understand it. And y'all you, are here on Wednesday night, so most of my folks in here, you got that. But if you don't have that, Everything else I'm talking about goes out the window. The first thing is to connect with him. The first thing is to recognize that God loves you and he loves you so much he took what is a risk in a sense and sent his son to die on the cross for you that you could be saved. But then he gave us this wonderful family as well, the body of Christ, that we're brethren, we're sisters and brothers, and we're able to link up together, and we can come together and have corporate praise and worship, and we can come together and have corporate prayer, and we can get involved in our church and serve in various areas and get to know other people and find you have a connection to this person and build authentic relationships with other people who can be there for you and who you can be, be there for in times of need. God is relational. He made us that way too. The word connection here means a relationship in which a person, thing, or idea is linked or associated with something else. One writer defines relationship, since it, that had relationship in it, as a relationship being other people outside of yourself to bond with, trust, and go to for support. I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about why connecting with others is important, why building connection with other people is important. Number one is it's where discipleship happens. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 tells us to go and make disciples. Go and make other students who will follow after Jesus. And sometimes the best way to learn how to follow Jesus is to see your life. Somebody may sit in the audience 
and they may listen to the messages that are up here, but they have individual questions sometimes about their life. And if they can see, oh, what did you do? I mean, this, is, this was huge. When I had kids, people were coming up to me, and I'm having a conversation. You see, I see a mother in kids' world, and we're having a conversation like, what did you do about vaccinations? You know, having a conversation, what did you do about, how do you feel about this? What did you, did you notice they have relationship being open because you find yourself in a similar place with someone? And what I found was when you're connecting with other people, even though you may not just be in it to get something, you get information. Sometimes you'll get good wisdom. You can be a support when you would think that somebody's family would show up because there's a tragedy and you get there and you show up and there's nobody else there. Connecting is important because in community is another place that you can experience God's love. I know to this day, uh, I've been married now, ooh, tw almost 12 years, so 11, nope, 11, so 11 years, 12 years in December. So my husband and I have been married, married 11 years and I still constantly say to the Lord, I just have moments where I pause and I'm like, thank you, thank you, Jesus. And I didn't marry a bonehead. Thank you, Lord. Because I, I often get to experience and see the love that God has for me even through him. Times that he waits for my crazy to be over and then a year later we're having a conversation and I'm like, you know what, I finally get this. And he just smiles and I'm like, you knew that already about me, didn't you? I never knew. I didn't know. You didn't, you didn't make me feel bad because there was something you saw that was a weakness for me or some area I needed to grow and come up in. And likewise, we, we look to be an encouragement to one another rather than tearing each other down because when you step outside your house, the world will do that for you. Home should be a safe place. Connecting is important because in community is one of the things I keep saying, where we give and receive support from one another. Galatians 6.2 tells us to carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Burdens here, when you study it out, doesn't mean, you know, you got a bill. Okay, I'm going to carry your burden for you. It doesn't mean, mm -mm. it means excess burdens. It burdens that are so heavy that they weigh us down. This denotes the idea of being there for somebody and helping them carry burdens during times of crisis and tragedy. This is a lost art form um, in our day and age. When people lose somebody, you know, and folks are, I got a lot going on too. I lost my mom five years ago. You weren't there. It's what the Bible says will happen in the end days. People become more about themselves. But where it shouldn't be, here in the house of God. And yeah, the church is going to do some stuff. Bishop and Pastor Deborah are going to do some stuff. But we should be there. We should show up. We should call. If you got to put it on you, I know there was a, um, there was a student that was at the school that my, my, kid, my, my son attends. And um, they weren't even there anymore but they had like a support system, somebody that was very close to them, and they passed away. And it was completely unexpected. And you know, I, we had like the, um, the God's Beauties fun walk that day. And I was like, ooh, because I know I need to show up. Like, I need to show up. I don't know who, who's gonna show up. I'm sure plenty of people are, but I really want her to know and, and understand like, yo, we're here. And so my husband and I, because we were going back and forth, who's gonna go? And I was like, I'm, I wanna go, I'm gonna go. So I went, and some of y'all might have saw me going to the bathroom. I went after the fun run, tried to clean myself up real quick, and I had a dress in my hand and drove, you know, drove to perfecting and went to the service. Why? To be there. I couldn't do nothing for her. I, I just wanted her to see us and support and, and know that we're supporting her and that we love her and that we've been praying for her and that we're going to continue to pray for her. And then I'm trying to reach out to her from time to time and just, hey, how's it going? What can we do? Is there anything we can do? Because she has a lot on her plate. She lost her, her main support system for helping her raise her kids. I'm not tooting my own horn. Not at all. I'm just giving an example. These are things that we, there are people you are connected to that you can be that for, and we should. Connecting is important because it's where we provoke one another to do good works and strengthen each other in faith. 
when you get together with other believers and somebody's talking about, yeah, you know, it's Random Acts of Kindness Day. You know, you're like, oh, is it? I didn't even know. You know, it helps to provoke us to do good things. As followers of Christ, we should be showing love to people born again or not and doing good things, things that are within your power to do. Connection is important because it, it's where many of us find our gifts and talents. Getting involved and serving and helping out and, and growing up here and getting to see different people, you know, like just where they, they went to serve. I, when I used to run um, Entheos, our young singles group that we had, and, and I was running that for a few years. And during that time, just I remember just certain people that volunteered, and I just figured out, okay, where do I stick them? Okay, I'll stick you here, I'll stick you there. And then seeing people down the line, you know, some of those people come up on stage and they're doing stuff and people getting called to ministry and doing all kinds of things. And where did they find that? They came and connected to serve just to do something for God and found out that God had a particular plan or calling for them or they had a talent sometimes or a gift that would put them in a position for them to go further with. Connect is important because in community, we're basically put it this, connecting is important because it can keep you around longer. There are literally over 100 studies that have found that having strong social ties increased life expectancy by 50%. One study said literally, and I quote, loneliness is a health risk factor, even more so than smoking, obesity, and lack of exercise. Some of you guys, you have a good, you know, you have a good group. You got some support in your life. Look to see where, what can you do? What else can you do? How else can you help? Whether it's joining, you're your supporting and helping us with the outreach and going to nursing homes or, you know, making sure we're visiting our own family members who maybe are older or who are, you know, unable to, to come to you. A lot of times people say, if you want a friend, be a friend, right? To, find, to be a friend, show yourself friendly. It's really real. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. One commentary that I thought was particularly good on this scripture said that iron cutting tools are made bright, sharp, and fit for use by rubbing them against the file or some other iron. So a man who being alone is sad and dull and inactive by company and conversation of his friend is greatly refreshed. His very wits are sharpened and his spirit revived and he is both fitted for and provoked to action. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he that walketh, the Amplified says, as a companion with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Well, we get the obvious lesson. Don't hang out with fools. Who is a fool? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Can't be your best friend. Somebody who doesn't believe there is a God can't be your best friend. The Bible says, it doesn't say it could destroy your life. It says it will destroy your life. But the other lesson here, focus on the other side of that, is that walking with wise people or being friends with wise people can make you wise. It is a wise decision, but also their wisdom can rub off on you in relationship. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Something I think that sometimes we've gotten away from is the Christian life is not just supposed to be about believing. It's also supposed to be about belonging. We're peculiar, but at least we could be peculiar together. It is a place where you should be able to come and belong. We know that doesn't mean everybody's going to like you, you're going to click with everybody. None of the above. I'm not saying that. Find some genuine relationships, though. Make some, if you don't have any, with other believers. And you might not be able to talk about doctrine with this person. Maybe, you know, they don't know, they don't know what they're talking about. But maybe they're really good at knowing how you can serve other people. Maybe they're really gifted at coming together and helping bring people together. Like, relate on what you can relate on. There's some major barriers, and I was wondering how I was going to get through this. In fact, I knew I wouldn't get through this. My husband said, he was like, that's a series. <laughs> I, was, I knew he was right. 
But there's some barriers to building genuine connections in your life. And there's one I really want to mention as we get ready to close here, because you have to understand that love is a risk. I'm not just talking about in a romantic relationship. I'm talking about in friendship. You're opening up your heart, and by opening up your heart, you leave the possibility that you can be stabbed. But you have to make a decision that isolation, and it is, science can tell you that isolation is worse than you having to recover from somebody betraying your trust or somebody hurting your feelings. Okay, let me just skip that. I will skip it for now. John 13, 34 tells us that we're to love one another as Christ has loved us. How did Christ show his love towards the disciples? He served them. He literally washed their feet. You know, they, they don't have cars. They're doing a lot of walking. Those feet are nasty. They are cracked. There might be some feces on there. You know, it's a, the society that they're living in and with all the animals and all, you know, their feet are gross. And Jesus is literally washing their feet. The son of God wrapped in flesh made manifest. We can serve one another and be a blessing to one another. As I close here, a couple of things I just want to bring attention to. It. And, you know, when you talk about what types of friends, what type of connections should I be looking for, I mentioned an imperfect one because nobody's going to be perfect. But people who are someone who's respectful, who's reliable, authentic, somebody you can be vulnerable with. Somebody who's encouraging. Some folks, I shouldn't say somebody. Folks that will be honest with you. It's a good idea to befriend people that are self-aware, that don't have a clue. You know, not, that, not folks that don't have a clue how they come off, are surprised every time they offend somebody, even though it happens every week. Pray, pray for that person. Or you may have tolerance for that person. Maybe you already have a relative that's like that in your life. You may have more tolerance for that person. But you put some boundaries around that. As I close, I want to encourage you, surround yourself with people who will fight for you when you're not fighting for yourself. Because the day and age we live in, it said men's hearts would fail them because of fear. If you're looking at the news and you tuning in to all this stuff, there's so much crazy stuff happening. We need one another to keep our heads on straight sometimes. Get in community. Get connected. Whether it's small groups, whether it's joining a helps team and serving. Um, some of you are already doing that, but you might be a little closed off. Open up. Give somebody a chance to get in there and actually and be vulnerable and show who you really are. Don't put this facade on. I get tired of walking around here. Bless your heart. I get tired of, oh, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I don't, I don't, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not walking through the halls. We're not walking through the halls and judging you. you know, like, it's not like that. It's, you're a person, I'm a person. I have jacked up stuff in my life. You got jacked up stuff in your life. I deal with some people who ain't got no sense or no self-awareness. No self you deal with some people like that. Take the wall down. Build some fences. Boundaries are good. It says where I end and where you begin. This is my boundary. That's nothing wrong with boundaries. But in order for us to love others the way that God said we're to love others, to love others like ourselves, we got to love ourselves. And if you love yourself, you got to take a risk and be willing to let people in so that you can be a blessing to them and so that they can be a blessing to you. All right, as I close here, I want to just ask everybody at this point to stand on your feet. We are created for connection. And there's so much more in the Bible about this when you just study out how we ought to behave towards one another. And I'd encourage you to, to take a look, to do a study. In fact, there's over a hundred times in the New Testament alone where we see the Greek word alalon, which means one another, each other, mutually or recipro reciprocally. Over half of those are commandments that relate specifically to how we are to live in relationship. 
teaching, encouraging, exhorting, loving one another, encouraging, sharing what you have, speaking the truth, confessing your faults. I'd encourage you to look into that. And you may be in here, and maybe it is just you've gotten to the place where you're so hurt and so scarred and so damaged by things that have been done to you by abuse that you've suffered at the hands of other people, by being misunderstood, by being the, the joke of the family, by being the person everybody's always looked down upon. And first and foremost, I want you to understand that there is a God, a creator, who does not see you that way and never will. He knows everything that you've ever done wrong and everything you will ever do wrong, and still he loves you, and he has a calling for your life that will be good for you. I'd encourage you to get into Isaiah 61. You may need counseling to really face up and deal with, how am I even really feeling about this? How do I unwrap this? But God loves you. And the scripture tells us that one of the anointings that Jesus bore or bears is binding up the brokenhearted in Luke 4 and Isaiah 61. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan to bind up that heart. Yes, it's by the anointing, but there's even paths that he will send you on, a journey if you are open to him and you're honest about where you are. He will walk you through and untie stuff and you'll be like, oh, I realized that happened when I was five. I didn't even recognize that that was the moment that I made a decision that I got to look out for me. You know, that I got to... He will unravel some stuff if you allow him and you stay in connection to him. And you're real and authentic. We can't put these facades on, but especially now with God. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. He knows who you really are. He knows you better than you know yourself. We're created for connection. But the most important connection for you to have is with the one that created you. He's the one who knew you and formed you in your mother's belly. He's the one that called you and anointed you and set a path for you. And so there may be someone in here tonight. I know we didn't have any visitors, but I know at the, earlier in the service, but I know there may be someone in here tonight who you say, I, I don't have this vital connection, this relationship with God that you're talking about, and I want to. While believers are praying with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if that's you here today and you say, I, man, I want to know God. Like, you, like I, this, is, this is what I've been looking for. I want to know God for myself. I want to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior and be connected to him and be a member of his family. If that's you and you're here today, just raise your hand and wave at me. Just want to pray with and for you tonight. Don't be ashamed. If that's you, raise your hand and wave. I just want to pray for you. Secondly, there may be someone in here, and maybe it's not that you've never been born again, but maybe you've fallen away from God. It might even be that you, you know, you can be sitting in this room coming to service every week, but you know in your heart you are mad at God, and you really don't want to talk to him. I really, I'm I just don't understand how you could let this happen. And you've fallen away from him. And you want to get that right tonight. You want to restore that connection and come back to him. If that's you in here tonight and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm not in right fellowship with God. I know I'm not. I don't feel like I should be mad at God, so I'm not really letting myself be mad at God, so I'm really just ignoring God. If that's you in here tonight, I want you to just lift your hand and raise your hand. I want to pray with him for you tonight. I see that hand. Pray, saints. We're, we are at the end of the service. Y'all know y'all about to go. But this is the most important part of the service. Anybody else? You want to come back to God today? Just raise your hand. I sense there's one more person. There's one more person. God is a wonderful God. He's respectful. <laughs> He'll respect your choice. If you choose, you know what, nope, I want to stay where I am. I'm mad. I don't want to deal with this. I don't, I don't, 
I don't see how this is going to work for me. He'll respect that. But he still loves you. He loves you enough that he knew you'd feel like that. And he still sent Jesus to die on the cross so that you could be born again. I see that hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There may be somebody else in here tonight that you say, I'm just not sure. You know, I, I, you wanted to raise your hand this last time around, but you were like, no, I think I did get born again at one point, but I'm just not sure that I'm saved. The Bible tells us that it was written so that we can know, we can be sure that we are saved and can have eternal life. And so if you're here and you're just like, I'm just not sure. I just want to leave here sure tonight that I'm born again. Just raise your hand so I can pray with him for you here tonight. I just want to know that I'm praying for you. Raise your hand. There may be someone else in here tonight <clears throat> that you've never experienced that wonderful experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit with the Bible evidence of speaking in other tongues. Let me tell you, it's so easy. And the amount of times where, you know, ministering in campus ministry or um, just up and close and personal with somebody where they shared with me how they tried one time and the folks was hitting them on their back and telling them to tarry or, you know, they told them maybe this is not your time. And it's so easy that a child can receive. It's not hard. If you want to have that experience, you can leave here tonight with that gift of being able to pray out the perfect will of God, praying in other tongues. If that's you tonight, just raise your hand. Just want to pray with him for you tonight as well. Make sure that you get that need met. And lastly, if you're here and you say, you know what, I want to join up here at Word of Faith. I want to, I want to be a part of this body of brothers and sisters and, and be a part of the body of Christ here locally. If that's you, just raise your hand for me as well. I want to pray with him for you. Amen. All right, well, I'm going to ask if you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, but you know that you should have. I'm going to ask you to do one thing, and that is drop the facade. Don't worry about how you look. Don't worry about what somebody else is thinking. I just want you to come right here on this blue line just so I can pray with and for you here just for a moment. It won't take long. We're not going to embarrass you. We've all been this way before at one time or another. So if you raised your hand, or you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, just come down quickly here to the blue line. Come on down. Don't be ashamed. If there's somebody near you and you don't want to come alone, we're a friendly church. You can ask, hey, would you mind coming down with me? Yep, come on. Give it up. Come on, come on, come on. It takes real, authentic people to be able to stand and come before God and say, yo, I need your help. <laughs> I want you in my life. All right. I know it's Wednesday night. I don't want to belabor the matter. I know there's one more person that had raised their hand, and I'll tell you that if you don't come down, you can come down at the end of the service and see one of the ministers on the blue line as well. But I just want to pray right now for this, this man of God that came down. So let's all just, let's lift our hands up to God because that's where our help comes from. That's really who we're talking to. And I'm going to ask you, sir, as well as the congregation to pray with me Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today to get right with you and give you my life. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And because I believe it, and because I have spoken it, your word tells me I am born again. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 
And I thank you now that I am saved. I'm in right fellowship with God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Sir, if you would, God bless you for coming down. I know your life is going to change from this day forward. If you would, this young lady right here holding up her Bible, if you would go with her for a minute, we have a free book we want to give you just so you know what to do from here. If you would just go with her, it only take a minute. We'd appreciate it. Praise God, that was powerful. I know that everyone was blessed by the ministry of that word. Now I wanna say congratulations to everyone that accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. This is the best decision of your life. And right now on the screen, there's some important information that we ask you to follow. Fill it out in its entirety and we'll send you a gift that will help you with the next step. Thanks everybody for joining. And don't forget the events for the rest of the week. And we'll see you at the next service.